Greetings, salutations, and words of goodwill. Welcome back. This is another video in my series on early Christian heresies. And the heresy we're going to be covering today is called Gnosticism. It shows up really early in the history of the church. So far back, in fact, there are probably certain instances in the Bible where the authors are specifically referring to its erroneous teachings. And most of our earliest extra-biblical texts, which deal with errors in Christian doctrine, are primarily concerned with the errors of Gnosticism, such as Irenaeus' Against Heresies and Ignatius of Antioch's Letters. As far as earliness in major heretical strains of thoughts go, it's preceded probably only by the Judaizers, which is why they were covered in the video before this. And even then, probably only because Christianity comes out of Judaism. If somehow it were possible that it originated within the context of the early Gentiles in that area, Gnosticism probably would have been the first and most immediate problem, which is why it becomes exceedingly prevalent as soon as the church begins to transition out of the mere Jewish community and into the Gentile world. Now, before going any further than that, I should probably start by correcting a mistake because many people often use the word Gnosticism to simply mean believing that matter is evil, um, implying that any group which believes that matter is evil would therefore be Gnostic. And while it is true that that was a characteristic feature of early Gnosticism, and obviously the word has been used that way in, the, in modern times, it's not really even an essential characteristic of the teaching, and certainly not its primary ideology. If you were to define Gnosticism more correctly, it'd be more accurate to say that it is a form of Neoplatonism which has been popularized using Christian mythology or Christian terminology. We'll talk about what Neoplatonism is pretty soon here in a second, but first let's talk about what it means for it to be popularized. Because Neoplatonism is a school of Greek philosophy, and as a school of philosophy, it exists primarily in an academic framework. It is certainly um, more than that. It's a way of life, but the practitioners of it tend to be academic in nature. They tend to be highly intellectual and very intelligent and capable of understanding and following complex abstract arguments. And when I say popularized, I don't mean so much that it was like not popular and now we made it cool, although there's probably some of that, it'd be more accurate to say that it was brought to the people and therefore morphed into a way that they could better understand. And while it's always been the case that uh, Christianity has appropriated aspects of Neoplatonism or their writings or their thinkers into its own uh, theological discourse and expression, this is really almost the opposite of that. It's Neoplatonists appropriating aspects of Christianity in order to express their own uh, Neoplatonism. And so what they've done is they've taken uh, the basic Neoplatonic framework, which again we'll describe here in a second, and they've used Christian terms and uh, aspects of the Christian story to express that. Um, thus making it more palatable to your average individual. And while it's very difficult, if not impossible, to express a robust Neoplatonism without asserting that matter is evil, um, I hope that you can see from this explanation that limiting it simply to the idea that matter is evil, or even to try to imply that somehow matter being evil is the most important aspect of the ideology, is to miss something exceedingly important. Now, I generally assume that when I'm speaking to people, they have a vague idea of the basic, most basic tenets of Christianity, um, namely that there's one God and that that God is somehow related to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that Jesus saves people by dying um, from their sins. There's a lot more to Christianity than that, but I basically assume that your average human being in the Western world who can speak English and therefore is listening to this knows that much. Um, I don't assume that the average person knows much of anything about Neoplatonism. And so in order to sort of describe the way that the Gnostics take Neoplatonism and 
m morph its expression through Christian words and story, um, you first have to have some sort of idea of what Neoplatonism is. To that end, I'm going to try and give a very quick synopsis of its ideology. Uh, perhaps at some point I'll be able to do a series of videos like this on uh, ancient schools of Greek thought, but at present that's not the goal of this video. So what are the essential elements of Neoplatonism? Well, obviously Neoplatonism means that it comes out of the ideas of Plato and that it's somehow newer than some form of older Platonism. Now, we're talking about you know the first century BC and AD here, so um, needless to say, it's new for them, not new for us. Um, and what Plato is most well known for, you might say Socrates within Plato's works, is the notion that the most primarily real thing is not the physical world around us, but ideas themselves. And that the cause of all of the things around us is some pre-existing idea of that thing. Now, the reason that Plato would suggest this, it seems, is that um, basically everything that we interact with falls into some sort of category. Um, it's, it's a type of thing. You know, it's a dog, it's a flower, it's a book, it's a table, right? Um, and especially those natural categories like dog and flower or mountain or rock, um, Plato seems to think repeat themselves and he can't give any explanation as to why that would be the case. Um, he understands abstract ideas, and this is a correct understanding of abstract ideas, as the uh, categorization of types of things. And so he says that the category uh, must somehow be more primordial, uh, higher in metaphysical terms than the individuals which fall into the category. And conceptually, of course, that's the way that we usually characterize it, right? Um, you have types and you have broader types and broader types. And as you get to broader and broader, you're usually moving up um, a, a conceptual ladder. And as you get more and more specific, you move down the conceptual ladder. And so we presuppose that higher categories are conceptually and therefore perhaps ontologically, that is to say, in reality itself, higher or more primary. And another thing that's true about categories is that they unite things, right? Uh, it makes them all one type of thing. And so although it's not as obvious in the writings of Plato himself, uh, one key idea at the heart of everything that Plato is saying is the question of unity uh, in relation to multiplicity, how some things become one and how they become many things. And so the category that Neoplatonists tend to understand um, as being most primary, most broad, is that of unity. That to be one is the most overarching category because nothing exists unless it is one thing. Um, even a, an army, you might say, which is composed of you know, hundreds or thousands of soldiers is not an army unless it is one army. Um, it might have a bunch of parts, but it is still one. And so, uh, and so they understand the world as coming into existence out of pure conceptual unity. And I emphasize that word conceptual because it literally is conceptual unity. The concept of unity is the most primordial and uh, metaphysically important thing. Everything else comes into existence out of that concept of unity. And so if it's going to come out of unity, then it must go into something. And what it would go into would be the opposite of unity. And the opposite of unity is multiplicity. And so unity spreads out of itself out into multiplicity and the word the verb that is used for that spreading out is emanate so unity emanates out into multiplicity 
And the thing in English, which we most often use the word emanate to describe, is, is light. Light emanates. And so this idea that they have is that, uh, in essence, the one, this is a metaphor, okay, but the one is kind of like a light bulb, and it's the source of all of existence, and it shines, right? And what does it shine out into? Well, it shines out, if it, in the metaphor, out into darkness. Um, and if you... Uh, go into a long room, right, without windows or very few windows, and you have a single uh, light bulb in there, what you'll see is that there ends up being a gradation of light. The area right around the light bulb is very, very, very bright, and the area furthest away from the light bulb is very covered in shadow. And in between, you get gradually, gradually more uh, bright or more dark, depending on which direction you're going. And so they understand all of existence, all of reality, to function essentially like this. Um, at the conceptual, not the literal, right, but at the conceptual center of all of reality, uh, or at its highest point, you might also say, is the concept of unity. And the concept of unity shines out into multiplicity, into manyness. And the further you get away from the concept of unity, the less unified the things you experience are. And the closer you get to it, the more unified they are. And so, and since unity is the cause of everything and the most important thing, you could also say that it's probably the best. Um, and so this unity, which the Neoplatonists call the one, right? is uh, also called the good or the beautiful because beautiful things are good and good things are best. Um, and therefore, this is not merely a blank expression of the way reality works, but it's actually a value-driven expression of the way that uh, reality works. And so the further you get away from the one, the less good things become. And so it's not merely unity emanating out into multiplicity, but it's also goodness emanating out into evil or bad. And it's also beauty emanating out into ugliness. So the most good and beautiful things are unified. And the most evil or ugly things are disintegrated, you might say, right? They lack an internal order. Um, but you could also say that they are somehow multiple or diverse. And next we might say that in addition to being good and beautiful, we've already said that this conceptual unity is the cause of everything else that exists. And so it is associated with being itself. Um, it is the simple act of being. And therefore, uh, being is also going to emanate out, and what it's going to emanate out into is non-being or non-existence. Um, and this is really fundamental because um, the way that the Neoplatonists understand multiplicity and evil and ugliness is that on some fundamental level, it's a form of not existing it's not real. Um, the really real, as we already said, is the conceptual. And the heart of the conceptual is this concept of unity. And so uh, that's what really exists. And multiplicity is, is somehow an act of not being. Um, ugliness is somehow an act of not being beautiful and um, multiplicity of not being one and evil of not being good. Much in the same way that darkness, and remember we said this was the analogy, that darkness is a form of not light. Um, light exists, darkness does not exist properly speaking. And what do I mean by that? Um, light is the movement of photons, right? It's caused by uh, these sort of like half particle, half wave things that uh, move through uh, through space. 
there aren't dark tons, right? There aren't the opposite of photons. Darkness is when the photons aren't there. Um, now, they don't have a concept of photons, but they accurately conceptualize light, that light exists, and darkness is when there isn't light. Um, and likewise, what they're saying is that evil is when there isn't good, or ugliness is when there isn't beauty, or multiplicity is when there isn't unity. And that, in and of itself, is a pretty good expression of the Neoplatonic uh, metaphysical framework in which the universe functions. And what you'll notice is we yet to mention matter or its state of being evil, which is why I say uh, that concept is not really the heart of the issue. But still, that's what comes next. Again, we said that this unity is a conceptual unity. And what, we've, what you should have noticed is that what's being created here is a series of dichotomies between unity and multiplicity or being and non-being or good and evil, or beauty and ugliness. And so there's one more dichotomy to really take seriously, and that is the dichotomy between conceptual and whatever the opposite of conceptual is. Um, and the Neoplatonists say, and they're probably right, that the opposite of conceptual is material. That thought is in essence a spiritual reality, which is why psychologists, remember the Greek roots for psychology are suke and logos, which means um, literally words about the soul, right? So psychology is an expression of how it is the soul works. And psychologists primarily concern themselves with um, diseases, you might say, in the use of the will, and in the use of the mind, the mind being the aspect of us that thinks. And so thought is really a spiritual reality, and it's quite obvious that the opposite of spirit is matter. Um, and so the opposite of conceptual is matter. And so the way they understand the world to work is that the conceptual uh, elements of reality emanate, diffuse themselves into matter. And that is why you might say that uh, Fido and Rover and Spot, three dogs obviously, uh, are conceptually unified. They fall into one category, and yet they are different material beings. Um, and so the, the idea here is that the concept of dog has been uh, imprinted on matter in three separate instances, far more than three in the real world, but in this example. And so this then is why matter in their thought process is evil um, because it lines up with multiplicity and non-being and therefore ugliness and evil or badness but in this series of dichotomies that is in some sense by far the least important um, aspect now why did this whole process start? If the unity is one, why would it ever become multiplicity? Um, and the answer that the Neoplatonists give is that somehow there was an act of pride. And so just like Christianity, they associate all of the moral evil in the world with pride. Um, and something, some aspect inside the concept of unity did not want to be unified with it. And so it attempted to become its own thing. And that's typically how uh, you get multiple groups of something. You have a unified entity, um, and then it starts to split into many different things. And usually the cause of that is a uh, desire to assert oneself uh, over and against some other aspect in the group. And the Neoplatonists associate that act of asserting with pride, and so they say that is the cause of the diffusion, the emanation of the unity into multiplicity. And the thing about the human person, which makes it, you might say, unique from uh, rocks and dogs and um, clouds even, right, whatever, is that uh, we have the capacity 
to, in humility, choose a return to the unity. And so that becomes their moral um, essence, an attempt to become spiritually, in, in that sense, very, very primarily conceptually united to the one, to the concept of unity through the acquisition of knowledge, which is why the Gnostics are called Gnostics, because they believe that you're saved through Gnosis. And the G-N-O in Gnosis is exactly the same as the K-N-O in knowledge, in right, you know knowledge, and you gignoskes, gnosis. And so the goal of the moral life for the Neoplatonist is in essence to seek unity with the concept of the unity in which is contained all other intellectual concepts. And so one seeks out knowledge in the highest, most abstract form. And one does this with a spirit of humility, an attempt to conform one's mind to the reality which is being perceived, as opposed to creating a conceptual reality or creating a conceptual framework. You're attempting to conform your conceptual framework to the reality which you're describing or which you're understanding more importantly. And when you grasp that full understanding, which is going to require all kinds of other moral changes in, in order to facilitate humility in your person, um, then you become one with the one, and hopefully on death your soul ascends to the heights of heaven. Something like that. And so that's Neoplatonism in a nutshell. Goodness, beauty, unity, existence are really real and thoughts fundamentally uh, which exist outside of the human mind and those things uh, diffuse themselves spread out like a light shining from a light bulb into probably won't get these in the right order as i did before uh, non-being evil ugliness multiplicity and therefore matter and this diffusion is caught, this emanation is caused by pride. And so the goal of the moral life is to seek humility and to seek uh, abstract conceptual knowledge in the context of that humility. And it's really at this point we can begin discussing Gnosticism itself, because that is the underlying um, ideology of Gnosticism. But remember, what Gnosticism does is that it takes that thought process and it then... Uh, makes it more palatable and more simplistic to the common man. And it does this, as far as Christians care about it, you might say, uh, by using Christian terminology and Christian storytelling um, in order to convey those ideas in a more simplistic, uh, easy-to-swallow manner. And so what the Gnostics say, or what they would believe, is that um, all of existence comes out of this divine being, which they associate or which is similar to the Platonic One. Um, and then they describe a series of emanations. And so like a series of levels coming out of this one. And uh, they use words from Christian vocabulary to describe each of those levels and the activities that are taking place in each of those levels. And the stories they tell and the levels they create are about as uh, multiplicitous as there are Gnostic teachers. But what you seem to notice about them is that they all seem to have some sort of uh, moral allegorical sense to them. And so maybe they're merely allegories or maybe they're also metaphysical, um, probably both in the ideas of at least the believers, if not the teachers of the Gnosticism, themselves. But what is common to virtually all, if not all, of the Gnostic systems is that you reach a point in the emanation where you encounter a figure from uh, Plato's Timaeus, which is called the Demiurge, and he is the thing that creates the material world itself, the physical world that we experience around us, and he does this in order to rule over it like a tyrant. 
And the Demiurge is, again, almost always associated with God in the Old Testament. And so the Gnostics are going to make a distinction between, you might say, Jesus, who is uh, intimately associated with the One, and then um, God as he appears to the Jews, who is associated with this Demiurge. And that is why God in the Old Testament is uh, so legalistic, right? Because he's actually a tyrant, and tyrants create excessive laws. And the reason that uh, the laws are lessened, you might say, in the New Testament, which we talked about in the Judaizers video, uh, is because Jesus is actually here to bring freedom, uh, freedom from the tyranny of the Demiurge and his excessive pride. And then Jesus is this, fix, this figure as a savior who comes from the one and in essence infiltrates the world of the Demiurge by becoming this material uh, being in what we would associate with the incarnation. And his goal is to train the elect, those who are able, um, to escape this material world um, and return to the one and thus uh, escape the tyranny of the Demiurge. And he does this, of course, by teaching secret knowledge, which is the gnosis of Gnosticism. Now, I should uh, make a distinction and notice that uh, the knowledge in uh, Neoplatonism probably wouldn't be referred to as gnosis, but as episteme, which in Greek refers to sort of an abstract conceptual knowledge, uh, often associated with uh, absolute knowledge of something which you can't be mistaken about. Um, whereas gnosis refers to sort of everyday knowledge, like uh, I know where my car keys are at. And so in keeping with that distinction, the gnosis that uh, Jesus teaches in the Gnostic stories is not a conceptual abstract knowledge that you would expect from Neoplatonism, but something more akin to uh, esoteric spells that you would expect to find in some forms of Egyptian paganism. And you sort of, when you die, you sort of travel through the underworld or the, the land of death and you have to be able to say these spells to uh, the individuals that you meet in order to pass through to the next level and ultimately reach paradise. Again, very similar to uh, ancient Egyptian um, understandings of what happens after you die. And so again, this is a popularized form of it, not its pure form. Uh, that is to say, Gnosticism is a popularized form of Neoplatonism. However, I would suggest, based on my... Uh, encounters with uh, the stories of Gnostics, which you receive from secondhand accounts, that probably what these spells are, are uh, sort of mnemonic devices, which actually have an ethic behind them. And so you learn the mnemonic device as an easier way of understanding the abstract concept. And then hopefully you put that abstract concept into practice um, in your life, but the average person probably didn't understand that's what was going on. And the people who were teaching them probably uh, knew that about the people they were teaching, but were perhaps hoping that this would be a better way to make Neoplatonism stick. Or they were just charlatans, which is always a risk uh, whenever someone is selling you something or trying to convince you of something. And so that's Gnosticism. Right? It attempts to dumb down this deeply uh, abstract and conceptual Greek philosophical school in terms that the average person could live out and understand. Um, and it uses Christian mythology to do that, uh, Christian terminology to do that. There's two other things about it I should add, however, before moving on. Um, and the first is this. It might sound very innocuous, right? You might say, okay, whatever. So uh, they're finding Neoplatonic ideas in the Christian stories and um, expressing the Christian stories for the sake of those Neoplatonic ideas. But because their goal here is not predominantly a Christian goal, but predominantly a Neoplatonic goal, 
they end up twisting the stories to such a significant degree and twisting the uses of the words to such a significant degree that oftentimes what remains is almost uh, not noticeably Christian except in word choice. And if you're someone who believes that in, in actual Christianity, that you actually have to have a personal relationship with the person of Jesus Christ, um, and that he is one with the God of the Old Testament. And so to reject the God of the Old Testament is also to, who created the material universe is also to reject him and therefore the entire goal of salvation, uh, you might say. Um, it's a pretty big deal. And the early uh, Christian leaders were very concerned about it because to the average lay person, it may not always be obvious whether or not you're dealing with a Gnostic or a uh, actual believing Christian. Just like I might add in the contemporary era, it's not always obvious if you're dealing with a liberal Protestant or in the Catholic world a modernist or someone who actually believes in the ontological statements of Christianity. And the second thing to note about Gnosticism before finishing is the way that they spread their thought process and their ideology. It was very common in this time period to have sort of uh, itinerant teachers, itinerant tutors who would show up in town and set up a school and uh, you could show up as an adult to learn from them or you could show up, as, you could send your child there for tuition and an education. And uh, these guys, this is typically how philosophers um, in this time period uh, spread their ideas and made their money. And so being more predominantly Neoplatonists than Christians, what the Gnostics did is they would show up in town and start a philosophical school. Uh, but they would claim that this philosophical school was also a catechetical school and also a school for teaching the faith of Christianity. And then everyday Christians would show up. And this allowed the Gnostics to sort of circumvent the hierarchy so that they could teach their Christianity to people uh, without having to uh, be vetted by the priests or the bishops. And um, needless to say, the clergy have a problem with this, not merely because it's undermining uh, their activities and uh, their authority, but because they aren't Gnostics and they think that Gnosticism isn't true and they're very worried about what their flocks are believing, which is why you have someone like Ignatius of Antioch saying uh, in his letters that you should avoid services where the bishop isn't um, and that where the bishop is, there is the Catholic Church, right? There is the, the unified universal Church of Christ because if the bishop is there, then who is whoever is teaching is presumably teaching something which is based first and foremost in Christianity and not first and foremost in Neoplatonism. So that's Gnosticism, and I hope that was somehow helpful to people's understanding. I know that Gnosticism uh, in itself can be pretty convoluted and confusing, so if anybody has any questions, you're welcome to leave them in the comments. I We'll try and either answer them there or maybe create another video to answer the questions. And uh, maybe in the future, although it'll be a long way off, I might break down a section of Irenaeus' Against Heresies where he describes one of these Gnostic myths to sort of show how it is that it serves the function I was discussing. There will be more videos on early Christian heresies, and I hope you watch those. And as always, uh, like, comment, subscribe. And until next time, God bless. And have a great day.